If you would turn with me, please, in your Bible to Psalm number 16. There is an ancient tradition that has been going on apparently for thousands of years that in the margin of Hebrew Bibles, the notation, the golden psalm of David is written such that it has become a a true tradition. And if you were to go into any synagogue and they would be opening this psalm, they would call it the golden psalm of David. Nobody really knows where that came from or why it is called that. But it is just something to keep in mind that as you read through this, this is a story of faith and confidence in God, and that if you hold true to what is being said in this psalm and others, then you will come to the position where nothing of the world can shake you, where you will be able to stand, and that knowledge in many ways is golden. Also, verse 10 is seen as a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, which is the Old Testament word for hell, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now people have wondered if David was speaking of himself. But David, of course, has died, and his tomb is visited. You can visit it today. And so he's clearly not thinking that he would be special or pulled out of all the other people that he knew and that he would be somehow resurrected or not see death. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, at Pentecost, Peter says, Brothers, I must say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And so in the New Testament, this psalm is being quoted at least in uh, paraphrase, stating that David was in fact uh, prophesying. Paul later in Acts says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he who God raised up did not see any corruption. And so David, whether knowing it or not, had penned thousands of years 1,500 years before Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would raise from the dead, that God's Holy One would not see corruption. And when Jesus was in the tomb, he went in the tomb Friday afternoon, and he rose early Sunday morning, and there was no decay, there was no corruption. He did not decompose while he was in the tomb. And so he is the only one that that happened to, If you recall, Lazarus was also raised from the dead, but they made the comment that after four days there would be an odor because Lazarus had started to decompose. Jesus is the only one in history that did not happen to. And so we look to that, and we look to that also as a sign of our resurrection, that even way back then God was talking about it. So if you look at this psalm, this psalm is a psalm in four parts. It's a poem. It's a poem that was put to music. It was a praise song. There is a parallelism in this psalm, and it follows the pattern of confidence in the Lord and then David's experience of faith. And so he talks about his confidence in the Lord in verses 1 through 4. And then his experience in this confidence or in this faith in verses 5 through 6. Then he goes back to confidence in the Lord in verses 7 and 8. And then experience of this confidence or this faith in verses 9 to 11. And if there's one thing that David wants you to get out of this, 
is the fact that it is never disappointing to seek God. If you truly seek after God as David sought after God, as David talks about in this passage, you will not be disappointed. Now, if you invent a God that is not of the Bible, if you come at God with your expectations and not His, then there may be a time for discussion. But if you truly, honestly seek the true God of the Bible, there will be no disappointment. And so we start with verses 1 through 4, David's confidence in the Lord. David, in verses 1 and 2, uses three different names or titles for God. He says, Preserve me, O God, that is Elohim, that is God Almighty. So when he is saying, Preserve me, God Almighty, he is using the name of God that expresses God's might and His power. For in you I take refuge, I say to the Lord, and here he uses the I Am, the Yahweh, the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. This is the covenant name of God. When this name is used in the Old Testament, it is used for the full power and promises of God, that when that name is being used, it is a recognition of, of the covenant and God's promises to the people. And he says to the Lord, you are my Lord, which is Adonai, which is master. And so he is saying, preserve me, God Almighty, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord of my covenant, you are my master. So he recognizes God's power and he's putting himself under the authority of that power. He is saying, You are my master, not you are my servant, not I can tell you anything you want. This is a confidence of faith. This is a confidence of what David sees in the Lord. He knows who God is. He knows who God is from the Old Testament that he had at this time. David was steeped in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, probably Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, and he was writing these things which were compiled in the Psalms. David started, he was the second king of Israel, and so the, the, fir- the first, second Samuel, first and second kings, that's the story he's living. But he had the law, he had God's desire, he had the story of the Exodus, which played a major role in the Jewish people and does today. And so he has a confidence in the Lord that he can declare that the Lord is going to preserve him. It is a request, but it is also a request in confidence that David, like everybody, and we can say, oh yeah, but he's the king and he you know, can get anything he wants, but David had a lot of his life where he was not the king. And when he was the king, he had problems. And so we can look at this and say that with David's ups and downs, he can look God in Scripture and say, preserve me with great confidence, knowing that God can preserve him, that over time, God is going to keep him. Over time, God is going to keep his hand on him. This is a statement of God's sovereignty. This is a statement of God's control. And then he says, you are my refuge. In you I take refuge. And this is a theme in the Psalms. Many times David will look at God and say, in you I take refuge, likening God to a fortress or a strong tower of sorts. And what this means is in the law that David had, in the knowledge of what God has done in the past and what God was doing in David's life, because David was anointed as a young boy out in the away from the city. And it was prophesied by Samuel that he would become king, and he did. He has a history with God. And many of you here All of you here have a degree of a history with God, some short, some long. But the idea that you can look back and you can say, yeah, God's been with me here and there and here and there, and I have a confidence in God. I can truly say with my whole heart, God Almighty, I can truly say 
God of the covenant. With us, it is the new covenant. It is the covenant of Jesus Christ, and we can have confidence in that. And then he says, as the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. And David is saying, there are other believers. And for us, it would probably be those who are around you. Is These are people who, who are examples of great faith. These are people who you can look to and you can say, I need prayer for this or I need help in this. And these things can take place because as God raises up a people, he isn't raising up an individual to be an island. He always raises up a people. And today he is raising up the church universal that is divided into many, many, many smaller bodies like ours. And these are the saints of God that have given their lives to God and they are the excellent ones. You are the excellent ones and you can come together as a body and we can delight each other talking about how we have confidence in the Lord. And then he talks in verse 4 also showing the confidence of God about how bad the other ones are, not the saints. The sorrows of those who run after other gods shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. In other words, David will not participate in the worship of the other gods or of the, with the ungodly. Pouring out a drink offering is, is a way that you can make an offering in the Old Testament. He will not participate that. In fact, he will not even know the names of these other gods or speak the names of these other gods, that God is greater than them and they do not exist. And then David turns the corner, as it were, and in verses 5 and 6, he talks about his experience of what he has gone through. And in 5 he says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The idea that God is holding his portion and his cup, it means that God is his sustainer, that things may be kind of thin or slow for David, but he knows God will bring it through and bring it through to the end that many of you here have had ups and downs financially, ups and downs with your family. Uh, and God has brought you through and God has brought you here today. When he says, you hold my lot, this is a Hebrew word that if you go back to the book of Joshua, Moses pulls the people out of Egypt in the book of Exodus, and the wandering and the giving of the law is the book of Exodus, and then they finally reach, for the second time, the promised land, and the reins are handed over to Joshua. And Joshua gets the word from the Lord that they are to roll dice, that they are to go into the land, and they're supposed to say, okay, this, this tribe, roll the dice, you get that portion. This tribe, roll the dice, you get that portion. And the idea is that God was in control, that God was putting each tribe in the promised land where they wanted, where God wanted them to go. And so we could actually say in the last part of verse 5, the Lord is my chosen portion of my cup. You hold my dice. And we can say, well, that's weird. But what it's saying is all the things of your life that you think are random, all the things in your life that you think have no cause, have no purpose, God cannot be in it. God is. God is in every random event. God is every showing of luck. God is everything that we throw to the fates. God is in that. God is so sovereign over all of it. There are no random events in a Christian's life. There, are no, there is no luck. When we say good luck to one another, what we should be saying is God bless you to one another because it is better to wish the blessing on people than the randomness of luck because with God... There is no luck. We could say the luckiest people are those that are saved, that are the people of God, but I assure you it had nothing to do with luck. 
It had to do with the sovereign love of God. And so he continues in 6. He says, The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places indeed. I have a beautiful inheritance. And this is, once again, looking back to the book of Joshua, where these large tracts of land that were lived in and developed by other peoples were given to the tribes by tribe of the Jewish people. And David is saying that what God has given him, the boundaries of that is great and his inheritance is beautiful, that he is not complaining about the apparent or seeming random events of his life. He is able to look at his life at every step of the way, even when he was running from Saul and living with the Philistines and doing all these things that we see as as difficult and horrific even. He can look at this and say, the boundaries of your blessing are wonderful, pleasant, I like them, and your inheritance is beautiful. It is, it is an idea today to say, okay, God, you brought me this far, but what have you done for me lately? That we, we want more, we want God to perhaps invade our worldly view of things, perhaps our finances. Uh, there is a whole movement of prosperity preachers who are saying that God wants you rich, but the only people getting rich in those churches are the pastors. There is no randomness, and you need to be able to, with a, with a confidence and your experience of what God has brought you through, look at your life and look around and say what God has given you is pleasant and you have a beautiful inheritance. And of course, this will be infinitely expanded in the years ahead and the thousands of years ahead when you finally meet Jesus face to face. David starts over with more statements of the confidence of the Lord in verses 7 and 8. In 7, he says, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me to bless the Lord is to say gratifying things about him, to to tell good things about him, either to God in prayer or to other people. We bless the Lord by speaking well of him, by telling of his attributes, by telling of what he has done for us, by telling of what he has shown in the Bible, of, of always lifting up in our speech. That is how we bless the Lord. And he says that God gives him counsel, And of course, God gives him counsel through the Bible. For David, it would be the law. For us, it would be through the Gospels and the story of Jesus Christ is that there is a counsel, there is a direction. Uh, There's many options today. You have a question about, should I do this or should I do that? Should I invest here or spend that or buy this or marry this person? or move here, or whatever it is. And many people today will simply Google it and say, is Seattle a good place to live? And then boom, they'll look at the things and they'll make a choice from what Google has to say. David is saying, why don't you pray about it? And while you're praying about it, why don't you read the Gospels? Why don't you read through Romans or Galatians? and see if God through his word is going to give you direction. And there are many people that I know who have done this. They did not know about Seattle when this psalm was written. God knew about it. David had no clue. So you're not going to read through the Bible and come to the phrase, move to Seattle. Not there. But you are going to come to a something about how you're approaching it or what you think about it or why you're moving or, or what you're afraid of or, or all these things that are going on in you that have nothing to do with the place or the car or the house or the job. This is what the Bible talks to. 
what is going on in you and the person you are making this choice. And then once you are steeped in the Word of God and you have God's counsel fully and complete, then your decisions will seem a whole lot easier, will seem even obvious and not decisions at all. He says, in the night also my heart instructs me. David is talking about sleeping and waking up with an answer from God. And I've known, I've heard countless stories of people who have done that, who have prayed, read the Bible, gone to bed, and in the morning, they seem to know what to do. We could say, wow, that's lucky. Or we could say, wow, that's the hand of God. And I think David would say, that's the hand of God. That's God speaking to you. God today speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit put in you. We do not need to hear an audible vo voice. We do not need to see a vision. We do not need to have a dream because Holy Spirit can talk directly to your brain, can talk directly to your spirit, which is somehow attached to your brain, and you seem to know what you do. Does God give visions? Absolutely. It's promised in Scripture. Does God speak through dreams? Absolutely. It's promised in Scripture. Does God speak through an audible voice? Absolutely. He did it a lot to the prophets in the Old Testament. But we don't need these things. Isaiah needed these things. We don't need these things because we have the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling in us and ministering to our spirit, telling us what to do. And so if you're really broken or confused or don't know what to do, read some scripture, listen to some good worship music, and go to bed. And then see what you have in the morning. Some people will always keep a pad of paper and a pen near the bed because they never know what they're going to wake up with and they might forget it. It's up to you how you want to do it. It works for David, apparently. It works for many Christians today that God can, while we're fully unfocused on life, actually speak to us. He then finishes the confidence in the Lord statements with eight, saying, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is my right hand, I shall not be shaken. In the previous psalm, it ended with, if I believe in God, I will not be moved. David is saying in this psalm that if God is with me, and I make God with me through prayer, through repentance, through scripture reading, through coming to church, through Bible study, I envelop myself in the things of God, and I cover myself with the people of God. And when that happens, I'm not going to be shaken. There's one thing the world wants to do today to you, and that is shake you and make you unsure, and make you wonder what's going on, and make you doubt God. First temptation ever given in the history of the world. Satan went to Eve and said, doubt God. God is a liar. That was the first temptation. And Eve said, you know what? You're right. I think God's a liar. And we are here today because of that. That is what Satan wants to do. That is what Satan is doing in the world, is that we can't trust in anything anymore. We can't trust in anybody anymore. And Satan wants us to be shaken. But if you come back to God, if you hold God close, when it says, if God is at my right hand, in the Old Testament, right hand was a euphemism for what you do, for your lifestyle, for your activities that if God is involved in those things, you will not be shaken. Now, can there be a trauma? Can there be a catastrophe? Absolutely. Will you be shaken? Yes, but it won't last. There are shocking things that can happen to you. And for a moment, people's first thought is not God. It's, oh no, a tragedy. 
But if you are steeped in the things of God, you will recover from that. And long term, if you look at your life, your life will not be shaken. David then finishes with verse 9 with his experience of his faith. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Because David has such confidence in God. Because he knows the law. He knows what God expects of him. And at this point in time, he's doing it. He is glad. He rejoices. And his flesh dwells secure. He feels safe because he knows that God will keep him safe. Because God has his hands around him. Because God is a strong tower. Because God does not turn his back on his children when they need him the most. Then in verse 10 he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. If David was speaking of himself, he was probably thinking about spiritually, that we will not see our, our, our being, that thing that is you, when you pass on, will not see corruption. For a Christian, when a Christian dies and closes their eyes for the last time, it is simply a change of location. You go from here to the presence of Jesus, and you will not sense any corruption. At the end of time, when there is a resurrection, your glorified body will be united with whatever it is of you, the spirit, the soul that goes up to heaven and you will live in an uncorruptible, glorified body for all eternity. And as I said, the only person who did that in this world was Jesus Christ. And where is he today? He is at the right hand of God the Father, interceding or praying for you. The Holy Spirit is praying from within you, and God the Father is receiving those prayers. Two out of three of the Trinity is praying for you constantly, nonstop. And if David had that knowledge, his confidence would be through the roof. That is a confidence builder. That is a faith builder in the people of this world. He ends with, You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And he wraps it up by returning to the idea that God gives counsel that his word tells us what to do, how to think, how to believe, how to move, what is solid and what is sand. All of this is biblical teaching. All of this is found today in the church. All of this is found today in Bible studies. These are things that we do so that we can stand up after living a life centered on God and centered on Jesus Christ, that we know the paths of life. We will be able to claim that we knew the paths of life when we stand before Jesus and He says, well done, good and faithful servant. We'll know that we guessed right. Actually, we'll know that we understood right and we did it right and we made it through the paths of life. The paths of life are paths in this life that leads to eternal life, and we have the fullness of joy, we have the pleasures forevermore. There is no disappointment. It is never disappointing to seek God. You may have ups and downs, you may have ins and outs, but ultimately at the end of time, everybody who truly seeks God will never be disappointed. David writes about his confidence in the Lord, and then he explains how that confidence is right by his experiences of faith. For David and for us, faith is the victory we need. We need faith in Jesus Christ. We need faith in God's holy word. And we need faith that God only has goodness in store for you. And if you believe that, if you learn about it, if you understand it, if it is in the depths of your soul, then you will never be disappointed in seeking God. We walk by faith, 
not by sight, but there will be a day when Jesus Christ comes back or takes you home in which you will finally see and you will know that it has all been worth it. This is the golden psalm of David, it has been called, and this is how it may have been put to music. Preserve me, God, I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God. My happiness is in you. in my heart for the faithful who dwell in the land Your sorrows increase for the ones who will keep chasing gods with whom I'll never stand preserve me God I take refuge Say to the Lord, you are my God. My happiness is in you alone. My happiness is in you. Portion and God, all I treasure is in you, my God. The thought that is mine is my perfect delight, a most welcome inheritance, Lord. The Lord I will bless for the counsel. Gives still at night time, he's guiding my heart. I keep him inside at my right hand, so I shall be able to stand on my guard. Preserve me, God, I take refuge.
Let us pray, Lord God Almighty, we have heard your word. I pray that you would put into each of our hearts such an amazing and unshakable confidence in you and you for what you have done and you for what you are doing and you for what you are going to do for only you have the past, the present, and the future firmly in your hand. And I pray that you would lead us through experiences that confirm our faith, that cause us to walk even closer and more deeply with you. Lord, I ask all this through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.